Hello, uh, everybody can hear me? Yes. Thank you for coming. I'm not Antonio Marx, I'm Lynn Santos. Antonio Marx will come next. Um, I'm head of the Cybersecurity Center, and the, both of us will give a presentation on um, cybersecurity in Portugal. I, will, I plan to talk a little bit about some concepts regarding cybersecurity. I think they are useful. Um, and then talk a little bit about what we are doing at the National Cybersecurity Center uh, in order to uh, have a more resilient cyberspace in Portugal. Okay? Uh, so, oh, I forgot the pointer. I always like to, to start with some, some messages, some uh, big messages I want to, to, to have to you. Um, in my presentation. So, two parts. First, um, I have to say that the world will not end tomorrow with a cyber attack or a huge cyber attack. There is no such thing as the cyber Armageddon, at least until now. So, we have to think and must always think that human rights do apply also in cyberspace as in the real world. So, this is a good message. And, of course, that cyberspace and uh, information and communication technologies uh, are still um, peace and development tools. So they are a good thing for us. They are a good thing for our um, well-being. Se second kinds of uh, second kind second kind of message that I want to to give to you is that there are some myths around cybersecurity. At least that's what I think when I talk to some people. Um, some of our partners, some of our stakeholders. And one of these myths is that if you have a good protection technologies, if, if you have the state of our technologies, you are safe. No, that's not true. You still can be uh, compromised, your security can be compromised because of a zero-day vulnerability or some advanced persistent threat uh, agent that is trying very slowly to, to get into your network. So this is a myth that you are safe because you have good, you have the state of the art technology in place in your organization. Okay? Second one, this is a more difficult one. Uh, this applies to small and medium uh, enterprises, which are the most of our ec economy in Portugal. So uh, I always get this answer. Uh, well, I don't have a problem because I, I really don't rely on technology to run my business. This is also a myth. Okay? Everyone depends on technology today. Okay? You don't have to have a big uh, information system in your company to actually depend on that or rely on that, on that uh, information system. Small things like smartphones, like computers, um, desktop computers, they are the base of all our business, of all our SMEs. Okay? So this is also a myth. And the most difficult one, cybersecurity is a tech issue. I always get this answer when I talk to C-levels. I always get this answer if I talk to an administrator of a company, to a CEO of a company. They do, really don't care about cybersecurity. And, well, that is a problem. But a, a, a bigger problem is that he thinks that cybersecurity is about technology. It's about machines. It's about information systems. And cybersecurity is not only about information systems or technology is also and is, is becoming more and more about people, is becoming more and more about processes. Okay? So we have to fight this, this myth, this, all these three myths. Okay, let's get to the presentation. I'll start with some concepts, cyberspace and cybersecurity from a, well, non-technical point of view. I hope that, that interests you. Then I'll talk about a little bit about conflicts and counter cyber conflicts. Then I'll talk about what we are doing, our main activities at the National Cyber Security Center, and well, trying to end up with a, a good message, uh, the idea of a whole of society approach to cyber security. Okay, where does the cyber prefix come from? Nowadays we have everything is cyber something, cyber terrorism cyber crime, uh, cyber security, um, cyber enabled devices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Where does cyber come from? It comes from this book from Norbert Wiener, 1948, the first uh, usage of the cyber prefix 
was in this book, Cybernetics. And what was the, the, the book about? It was about the relation between man or human and the machine. Okay? And the, the interesting thing about this book is that Mr. Norbert actually believes that something new comes out of this relation between the human and the machine. I'll try to explain this later, okay? But this was the first time that the cyber prefix, prefix was used. The term cyberspace, William Gibson, first on a, a short novel called Chrome, I don't know why, um, but in a novel it came out in this um, um, Neuromancer novel, and he defines cyberspace as a conceptual hallucination. I really believe this, this is something like a conceptual hallucination. You just have to look at your bus or your train. Everyone is actually working on your smartphones, messaging, texting, uh, phoning, uh, browsing, etc., etc. Everyone is actually interacting with the, the smartphone. Never happened to you being on a train and everyone was hallucinated on the train with the, with the, with the machine, with the technology. So I really like this, this definition of um, collective hallucination from William Gibson. So, but what is cyberspace? Well, cyberspace is the physical part, is the connections or the interconnections between routers, between machines that actually make what we call the internet, uh, fiber optics, silica computers, um, coax cables, um, hybrid coax and fiber uh, cables, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It has its infrastructural, its physical part. It's not only that. It's also about social media, interaction between people. So it's a media, it's a, it's, it's a mean of communication um, between people, right? But it's also virtual reality. Some, does anyone remember what this game was? What was the name of this game? Second Life. Second Life, exactly, yes. So it's also about virtual reality. It's also about this uh, uh, new realm that is built up of this infrastructure and the interaction between humans and the machines, okay? Cyberspace is also this. And it's also a domain, a domain for disinformation, a domain for battles. It's also a new domain where you, you can actually run um, campaigns, propaganda campaigns, you can run attacks uh, against an en enemy or an adversary, okay? So cyberspace is all of this. It's not only one thing, it's not only the internet or the infrastructural part. That's, that's the main message. So, cyberspace refers to the usage of technology. So if you have uh, a term like cyber terrorism, you must look at the definition of terrorism and actually adapt it to terrorism using technology. It's rather easy, right? Crime is also crime as you know it, it's in the panel code, but with the usage of technology to commit those crimes, okay? So it's rather easy to actually conceptualize what, cyber, what cyberspace is. It's a powerful media that magnifies communication. That's easy. It's decentralized and territorial. There's no body in the world that actually governs the internet. There are some powerful um, organizations like ICANN, uh, that actually have a major role with IP address space and domain name space, but they actually don't run the whole of the internet. It's decentralized, the, the governance of the internet, okay, the physical part, as well as the other layers, the communication part, the virtual reality part, okay, they are also uh, decentralized government, and mainly they are in the hands of private sector as well, okay, it's different from other other realms like air, sea, or space, which have, we have, in, or international organizations ruling it, or you have your national sovereignty applying uh, state of law to these territories, okay? They, this is very different. It was at the beginning uh, associated with the Utopian liberty, but this is not new. This happened with all new medias like radio, like televisions, like newspapers. You have always the idea that you are flattening the power in the world, that somehow citizens will have more power against governments. Well, it happened in the beginning. Open source, open source movements was a very good idea to flatten this power, okay? But this tend to, 
to 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 end uh, and actually right now states are using the technology in their benefit and mainly companies big companies are using this technology as well to have power over you as you may know okay and also a sense or a false sense of anonymization that's one of the of the characteristics of cyberspace as well we always say and we think that we have different discourses regarding cyberspace and if you have or regarding cybersecurity sorry and if you look at the sec at security with a comprehensive approach okay not only um, internal security or external security defending your borders or maintaining the order within your territory or maintaining the rule of law within your territory within your, within your nation and you think that actually the, the security the concept of security is, is being br uh, broadened to things like environmental security or human security or economic security uh, you, you, if you apply this to cybersecurity, you'll end up with four different discourses. First one, of course, defense. You have to protect your territory from attacks from your external enemies. And within cyberspace, it is very, very difficult. You don't know if your enemies are inside or outside, or both. Okay? The attribution of attacks is a very difficult thing to do in cyberspace. So the, the defense discourse is all about sovereignty, the application of the rule of law within your territory, but it's also mission assurance for military when they are abroad in their uh, military missions, and of course the exploitation of cyberspace in the benefit of your country. You have the homeland security or the internal security discourse as well, and this means fighting cybercrime, and this means protection of your critical infrastructures. This is maintaining the order and, uh, and the functioning of the country. This is the internal security perspective. It's not the only one. The European Union tends to focus cybersecurity on the digital markets or the single digital markets. So it's all about the confidence of users, the confidence of consumers using this new realm, using this new um, domain, okay? And it's also being seen from, uh, from the European Union as a way to achieve uh, economic growth as well. Innovation is the word uh, right now, okay? So digital market and economic growth. But it's also about civil liberties, a fourth discourse regarding cybersecurity, okay? It's about human security, as I said. It's about having the same rights you have in the, in the physical world within the virtual world, achieve privacy, achieve freedom of speech, and achieve all the other human rights that you know from the fundamental chart. Okay? Cyber Utopia. You remember this? Who remembers this picture? It was not a long time ago. It was from um, uh, marketing um, on TV from a communications operator an orange flag communication operator. It brought together all these uh, guys, where is the pointer? Here. Brought together all these guys from different, well, um, um, kinds of music, all together. And the, and the motto was all together now, the Beatles music, you don't remember it? It was from Nas. Otimus, Otimus, sorry, Otimus. Yes. And the idea is here, here is that cyberspace will bring everyone to, together, will we'll, we'll sh make short or shorten the distance between people. And look, and look this is in a, in a rural area, so the idea of the global village as well is in, the, in, this, in this poster. You have everything here. It's all about constructing again the Babel Tower everyone speaking the same language all together now. This is the cyber utopia for the internet or for cyberspace. We have books on that. The most important one is this, Here Comes Everybody from Clay Shirky. If you are really interested in this thing, you have to read two books. The first one from Clay Sharkey, A Cyber Utopian, 
and the next one, well, this is the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace from John Barlow. Very good document. On behalf of the future, I ask you governments to leave us alone. Don't regulate. Don't come into cyberspace. Cyberspace is ours. I was saying the second book you have to, to read is The Net Delusion from Evgeny Morozov. Very good. It's an answer to Here Comes Everybody from Clay Sharkey. And it says, well, I really like your ideas, but you are terribly wrong. The power is still gathered in governments and in big companies. Now, let's talk about cybersecurity and let's try to, to, to see how the cybersecurity is becoming more important to us as a society. Okay? What are the major events in the recent years that actually uh, put cybersecurity in a higher stage of importance? Well, the first one was in 88, more is warm. The internet was still a very um, small um, infrastructure. And there was this Maurice Worm that actually put engineers to think, well, how do we deal with incidents in a distributed infrastructure with no centralized body to actually react? That's where came where, where the um, Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh um, started to run the computer emergency response team. Okay? 88, because of this Morris War. Second one, between 90 and 98, something called polymorphic viruses came into the wild. This was the time when antivirus lost their uh, efficiency. So this was the time when bank fraud, uh, identity theft became very common. This was the time where law enforcement and criminal investigation actually had to put more effort tackling this kind of misbehavior on cyberspace. Okay? So this is a huge event that actually changed the cybersecurity from engineers also to law enforcement agencies. Okay? The second one, the third one, sorry, 2007, 2000, and 2008, two big events, one in Estonia and another one in Georgia. The first one, a huge hacktivism incident. And the second one, one of the first appearance of hybrid warfare. At the same time that the tanks were, were actually invading Georgia from Russia, uh, North Ossetia, um, at the same time the telecommunications and the internet were, were putting down by cyber warriors. Okay? These events actually put cybersecurity at the stage of defense. And this was the time when most of the military um, authorities in Europe and around the world start to think, well, this cyber realm is also a battlefield and we have to prepare our troops to deal and to tackle also in this new um, battlefield. Okay? So cybersecurity gets higher at the level of importance. Then we have the Snowden revelations. Okay? NSA was spying um, all over the world uh, people. So it, it was not only about um, a nation defense, but it's also about human defense. It's about um, civil liberties that were actually impacted by uh, some states. So cybersecurity once again raised its level and became more important. As we can see, we have to fight for our human rights within the cyber realm. Okay? This was a time when we, we, we heard that Angela Merkel's phone and Dilma Rousseff's phone were being tapped. Okay? So this also brought cybersecurity to the scope of diplomacy. Diplomacy started to work for or with cybersecurity as well. And two groups were formed 
at the, U at the UN, the United Nations, to actually try to arrange some kind of uh, international policy regarding cybersecurity. And we have one from 2013 and another one from 2015. And recently we had the Cambridge Analytica. So cybersecurity became more important. Why? With the Cambridge Analytica scandal, or if you, if you, if you may say also with the interference within the US elections, it became more important because it was not only about securing your borders, it's not only about securing your privacy or securing your civil rights, it's also about securing your regime, your democratic regime. Cybersecurity is also about securing the way we live as a society. That's true? Okay. So, as you can see, cybersecurity is evolving over time. That's the idea I wanted to bring with this slide. I don't know what, what will end. I have space on the slide for the next events. Okay. Now, let's talk about a little bit cyber conflicts. You can characterize cyber conflicts by tools and techniques used that goes from physical attacks to actually social engineering, disgruntled employee, advanced persistent threat, hacking, information gathering, denial of service. There's a lot of tools and techniques to perform cyber attacks. But you can also characterize cyber conflicts from the threat actor that's actually behind this, these techniques and these tools. And this goes from students from high school, students in university, to cyber warriors, professional cyber warriors, working for um, organized crime or working for states. Okay, so there's a huge range also of threat actors. Then you have motivations, can vary as well. It can go from peer reputation a group peer reputation. The idea is actually to have uh, whoever performs the best hack will actually have a better reputation within the group. That's obvious. That's social, social uh, construction. Okay? That's the idea. But then you have other motivations. You can have um, motivations, for instance, financial gain. You can have motivations, political motivations. You can have religious motivations. There's a lot of motivations as well. And finally, the targets. And actually, you can target a person, a company, a state. Okay? It's also ranges. So you, ha you have a lot of uh, cyber conflicts and can be characterized by these four vectors. Some major events already mentioned the Estonian Infrastructure Services attacks on 2007. In 2009, we had a, cyber, a huge cyber attack, a successful cyber sabotage attack from the US and uh, Israeli to, against the Iranian uh, enrichment plants in uh, Iran. You had more recently, 2016, attacks to the critical infrastructures uh, power grid uh, in Ukraine uh, attributed to the, to the Russians. And more recently, you had the, the WannaCry attack uh, that had a huge impact in a, a, lot, of, a lot of economies. Uh, one of the most affected was the UK health system. Okay. Now let's go about what, what do countries have uh, to counter these cyber conflicts? Well, you have everything you have for the physical realm. You have diplomacy, you have war, you have criminal system, and you have simple protection. All the rest. The actors are exactly the same. Diplomats and state officials, armed forces, law enforcement agencies, criminal prosecutors, judges. So whenever there is an incident, you can think, well, who, is the who has the responsibility to tackle this incident, to handle this incident? Everyone. An incident actually impacts the security of our organization or the security of a human being, right? So we have a, you have a simple protection field of action. 
you have to actually you look at the incident incident as the uh, impacted on the confidentiality integrity and our availability or inf information or information systems and the idea is here is to have some kind of business continuity you have to put your business going you have to recover your um, loss for instance okay the idea here is to only to recover the credibility the level of security that you need to actually run your business but at the same time the same incident is also a crime uh, uh, something like 99 percent of the time is also a crime so it has to be investigated and the idea here is completely different it's not business continuity the idea here is to identify who were the responsible for the attack and bring them to justice so it's another layer of action a parallel layer of action the same incident remember then you have war if this incident amounts to the uh, to the level of the use of the uh, unlawful use of force within the UN Charter you can actually get back and fight back okay so we involve military guys and you look for information assurance and cyberspace exploitation and of course war is all, is is the continuation of diplomacy uh, uh, by the fourth so you always have diplomacy to to actually hand up your conflicts okay now about the cybersecurity center it was established in 2014 very young um, we are something like 25 people uh, and these are the main activities we do training awareness raising and capacity building for the country we actually work on cyber norms creating cyber norms uh, technical norms and uh, regulatory uh, piece of, of, of law uh, we work a lot with national international cooperation and we do incident response coordination this means that the cybersecurity center and and cert pt computer emergency Resp risk uh, computer emergency response team in portugal uh, is actually something like the the um, fire the firemen against fires okay so something happened and we have to recover from from the losses and the impact talking about cyber norms this is just a slide to show that in europe everyone is is actually working on it uh, you have some labels that actually are uh, frameworks to establish a basic level of cybersecurity for companies um, and or for small and medium enterprises okay you have it on the UK you have it on on uh, Germany France Italy and then you have the ISO International Standards Organization uh, frameworks as well we are working with cyber norms in Portugal as well um, by the end of uh, this month we have the, we'll have the first draft of a cybersecurity framework for Portugal um, and we will have um, a final version by the end of March uh, we are not reinventing the wheel we are using the same methodology as the Italians did we are adapting the NIST uh, the US NIST cybersecurity framework to our reality but then we will also have mandatory security re requirements for uh, these seven uh, economic sectors we are responsible within the law to actually um, define mandatory security requirements for what we call operators of um, essential services the most important companies in Portugal within these um, seven uh, sectors okay and we'll also build this will be ready in July something like July then we will we have maturity models the idea here is to help companies to um, achieve this um, baseline capabilities for cybersecurity the idea is to create technical information to have education and training online education and training and have some kind of a self-assessment tools to actually help companies to raise their maturity to raise their preparedness to deal with these cyber conflicts and on top of that we'll have a cyber assessment framework that actually assess products uh, that are compliant 
with, uh, with the framework. Maturity models. They are focused on the capabilities and skills and not on measures and, and, and controls. They define investment priorities and they provide the benchmark analysis. We can also, we, we will, will be able to say that your company is at percentile 40 or percentile 10 or percentile 90 uh, within your sector or within the country. This is a very powerful tool to actually promote um, the, the, the company to raise their, their investment in cybersecurity. If you are in percentile 10, something is wrong, right? Finally, I'm trying to focus on this technical part regarding the, the audience, of course. Cert PT, Computer Emergency Response Team, we do the incident response coordination for Portugal. Fortunately, in Portugal, we have a CCERT network uh, that has more than 40 companies that have uh, computer emergency response capabilities that work together with us um, responding to cyber attacks. This was very useful with the WannaCry for instance, when I cry that there was this huge company in Portugal that told us, oh, we are seeing something new in our networks and something is happening. Um, with, the, with the indicators they gave us, we actually contact the international network and someone, someone told, uh, Spain actually, told us, yes, there is a huge ongoing attack. The problem is this, and right now we have these countermeasures to avoid um, infiltration or to avoid um, compromise. So the idea is to work in, uh, on a huge network to actually be fast to respond or to react to cyber attacks. What we have done, once we had the um, remediation, the mitigation tools, we actually deployed to the 40 uh, contacts that we had and they applied in their systems and, and uh, of course uh, avoid a huge impact in their, in their companies. We also do vulnerability imagine, uh, management. This means that we receive information about information systems that have some kind of vulnerability that compromise their, their data, let's call it, um, and we actually work with the affected site um, trying to recover or, or, or um, update their system to, to end up with this vulnerability, okay? We are part of the major international um, cooperation groups. National cooperation, we have the national CSERT network, as I said. Um, we, we have a project trying to, to set up uh, information sharing and alerting centers in Portugal, sectorial. This means that some problems for cybersecurity or regarding cybersecurity uh, only applies to this or that sector. And we have specialized um, knowledge to, to distribute within the sector. So we are trying to set up these sectorial groups called ISACs. We have the G4. G4 is, um, well, it's a group of the four um, organizations that actually do operations on cyberspace or have some operational responsibility regarding cybersecurity. This means the National Cybersecurity Center, um, Intelligence Service, um, Police Judiciaria, Law Enforcement, and also the Cyber Defense Center. Okay, we work together and we exchange a lot of information, helping our uh, everyone within our responsibility, but uh, working on the same in different layers with the same incidents. Then we have a lot of international cooperation. Cooperation group is a high-level cooperation between um, national security, national cybersecurity authorities. European CERT Network is a formalized group of 20, 28 computer emergency response teams. MeliCERT is a platform or um, a set of platforms to exchange information uh, between certs in Europe. TFC cert is another uh, fora um, for C cert that has more than 150 computer emergency response teams. And the global um, community is the for Forum of Incident Response and Security Teams. First, we are uh, part of all these uh, fora. We do also we also do um, awareness and training programs. Still a lot to do in this, in this field. We have a train-the-trainer model, so 
We are 25 people. It's impossible to, to raise awareness for the 10 million Portuguese. So we have a train to trainer pro, uh, process and our trainers actually go and, and uh, do awareness on our behalf. Um, the training will be focused on the maturity models that we are setting up. Finally, I would like to talk to you about uh, when uh, defying or um, very challenging project we have. We want to build situational awareness for Portuguese cyberspace. This means, this means that we want to know the level of threats that are coming from outside our cyberspace and also we'd like to know the level of preparedness that our companies individually have to tackle these threats. So there's the external reality and there's the internal reality. We are gathering information and we have a modular system that actually will try to perform reports and alerts to our constituents, to our partners mixing up the internal reality, the level of preparedness of each uh, company, of each organization, with the level of outside threats that, that we have. This way we, we can prioritize our actions. We can say that for this level of threat, this company is prepared, we don't have to worry, but these companies are very sensitive, so we have to work with them. The idea of this is to have a whole of society security that gathers all, uh, not only uh, this technical part, this uh, response part, but also education, economy, defense, diplomacy, health, territorial environment. This cybersecurity actually um, touches everything. With this, we'll probably have a better awareness, better cybersecurity culture, better cyber norms more resilient business, more resilient critical infrastructures. So, some future trends. The ubiquity of the cyber realm is, I think, obvious. Um, we'll start to talk about digital sovereignty, the militarization of cyberspace as well in the future. We already have personal data monetization. We need to develop international law in this field. Uh, we will uh, see also a governmentalization of um, internet or cybersecurity governance, and we need security by design applied to public policies. Cyber is everywhere right now. Thank you very much. So, good afternoon. Uh, hope you're still awake. Uh, I think the previous presentation was quite uh, interesting for you to know what's going on in, in Portugal as far as cybersecurity is concerned. I'm uh, Antonio Marquez. I'm, I'm actually the National Information Security Authority in Portugal, and I work with Lino Santos in the Cybersecurity Center. Uh, I also have another area in my uh, under my supervision that takes care of the life cycle of classified information, but I'm not going to talk about it uh, today to you. Uh, anyway, why do uh, organizations and countries uh, need such a, uh, an organization, so, such an entity? Uh, the reason is uh, because we live in a connected world, both physically and virtually. Uh, and the raw material of this connected world is, as we all know, data and information. And why do we play with data and information to get knowledge because we live in a knowledge intensive society. Uh, actually, uh, IST, this, this uh, wonderful university in Portugal, is uh, well known throughout the world because it produces uh, very good engineers that take care of the IT part of uh, knowledge uh, society. Uh, we actually uh, know that this is such, a, such an important issue that Economist, the well-known uh, magazine uh, Economist, has dedicated uh, an old uh, a front cover of, of, of one of its issue, issues on, uh, on knowledge and information. And as you can see, uh, the, the platform oil uh, the, uh, are changed, the name is changed to to be told or to be called Google, Facebook, and so on and so forth. Uh, 
but we also live in a world where this equilibrium, this white and black that should be uh, balanced, is not balanced because everybody uh, in, uh, in every area of, uh, of the world, there are the evil and there is the, the, the not so, so good things. And we also, and we often have uh, people that uh, dedicate his life to stealing, to exfiltrating information uh, from where it should be. But anyway, uh, the economist of this year, uh, so of 2019, uh, as uh, they have highlighted that uh, uh, two of out of the five most important things are cyber related. This one is cyber attacks, theft and data uh, or money and cyber attacks disruption of operations and infrastructure. So this is the, the theft of data, this is the infrastructure one. So you see at the Economist World, World Economic Forum level, they have also highlighted this as uh, very important things. Uh, this gentleman that you, uh, I'm sure you know is uh, Mr. Juncker, uh, the president of the European Commission, has also uh, stated that cyber attacks can be more dangerous to stability of democracies and economies than guns and tanks. And actually, Linus Santos has touched on that. And uh, the European Union that will have this year in May, as you all know, uh, elections, uh, is quite concerned with that. And they have produced this study, uh, Election Interface in the Digital Age. And uh, you can download the study through uh, the link that is in the bottom of the slide, uh, where 65, uh, st uh, 65 statements, uh, about one, one, page and, one page and a half of 65 personalities, uh, they, they give their own opinions on that. And it's quite an interesting one. And uh, if you have the time and you have the interest, uh, you, should, uh, you could download it and, and take a look at it. Uh, but anyway, this is quite important for us uh, because it can interfere, as Lino Santos has told you, as, uh, in the way we all we live today in a, so, in a, in a democracy. Uh, in, in, in Portugal, everything related with the security in cyberspace is framed uh, through a strategy. We have a strategy that has been published in June of 2015 and we also have developed another one that is doing the, the, the process of, of being uh, you know, analyzed by all areas of the government. And uh, I'm going to talk to you very quickly about, about the new document. So the new document establishes a vision that uh, states that Portugal, through cyberspace, wants to be a secure and prosperous nation, be innovative, so R&D is very important, and the connection with the industry is very important. Uh, be inclusive, so a whole of society and a whole of government approach. Uphold constitutional and democratic values. Why? Because we are a democracy and we have a constitution that uh, honors those values. Uh, the strategy has three objectives, three strategic objectives, and it, they can be read as, such, as, as follows. In order for us to maximize release, resilience, that is in the leftmost part of the slide, we need to promote R&D and innovation to be upfront uh, in, the, uh, in the edge of the wave and also creating and preserving the right resources. And if you are in this university, studying in, univer in this university, and you are thinking of uh, de deepening your studies in cybersecurity, I'm sure you'll have a, a very comfortable uh, future because the demand for you is, is very, very high. Uh, the national cybersecurity strategy is divided in six axes. Uh, one speaks about governments, governance, since this is a all of society and all of government approach, we have to have some kind of board that governs the, the, the execution of the strategy, otherwise it wouldn't be executed or it would be executed in a very heterogeneous uh, way. Uh, the second axis is prevention. The prevention, we constantly observe our environment, we train our society and community, and we also educate current and future generations. So the focus of this axis is actually uh, education and training and observing the environment. The third axis is protection. 
protect the crown jewels. The crown jewels in informational crown jewels are those that in each organization identify uniquely uh, the, the, the organization and, and these are the pieces of information that differentiate that organization from the other so they have to be protect, pro uh, protected very very carefully. Uh, we have to demonstrate through various means that we are resilient and we are we have also to be conscious of our ecosystem that I'll present to you very uh, quickly and the fourth axis is to respond uh, we have to be able to respond uh, through the partnership and demonstrate and give notice of our uh, capabilities. We have to, to do everything that is in the left part of the slide, focusing on the future through research, development and innovation in a solid and cooperation uh, both internally and externally. So the strategy is divided into si these six axes. Uh, we are also working already in our action plan and in our communication plan. We want to communicate to our society what, are, what is the state and the government doing on behalf of cybersecurity to our society. Uh, has, uh, as I told you, uh, this strategy has a governance structure. The governance structure is the National Cybersecurity Council. Uh, it's uh, shared by a member of the government. Uh, and it has a very broad, uh, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of entities that are around the table. And in this, in this part of the slide, uh, we highlight the, the private part. So the, the small and medium enterprises associations and the network uh, of national CSERTs that, uh, as Lino told you, is 40 members, more than 40 members large, the majority of them being uh, industries of, our, uh, of this country. Uh, the ecosystem, the cybersecurity ecosystem in, in Portugal is uh, made basically of these entities. In the center part, in, uh, in dark blue, uh, you have the core, the core that is the, uh, the cybersecurity center with the CERT. They are co the CERT is a part of the National Cybersecurity Center. The Intel community, the intelligence community, the Cyber Defense Center that belongs to the Minister of Defense. And here, this acronym stands for the Cyber Crime and the Technological Crime Unit of, of, of this country. So these entities in, in the center of the slide is, are actually the core uh, of, of the cybersecurity ecosystem. And we also have in, in uh, orange the banking sector, the network itself, uh, the industry, the academia, and also uh, the cyber diplomacy here as well. Uh, to uh, remember uh, what Lino told you with the development of the, the threats, the cybersecurity uh, aspects reach the political and the diplomatic level, so we also have an, a cyber ambassador. And, and uh, uh, the, the functional areas are also quite broad uh, and cover every area of the society. Uh, look in this side of the slide, the cooperation, the public-private cooperation, the public-public cooperation, and the international cooperation. In the leftmost side of the slide, the critical infrastructure protection, everything that relates with sovereignty and everything that relates with situational awareness, so the observation of what is going on and the assessment of what is going on, and around the national coordination that belongs to the National Cybersecurity Center, you have a lot other areas of uh, what we call and what we consider the cybersecurity functional areas. Uh, but what I'd like to, to tell you uh, as a, a main message is that uh, regardless of what you do, cyberspace is also, and above all, uh, a behavioral domain, where we behave very often as we would like to behave in the physical domain, but sometimes don't dare uh, to behave in the physical domain. That's the reason why we think that the major weakness of the cyberspace is us, the human beings. And for that matter, and for that reason, we think that the, the most 
valuable investment that we can do in these areas is invest in the human factor. And in here I have also a link to a very interesting uh, article that it was published already in September of 2015 in the Harvard Business Review where they tell you why they think uh, the investment, the major investment must be in the human factor. And you being here uh, in, in, this, in, in this university are a living proof of how important it is to invest in the human factor. Uh, because if you invest in the human factor, you uh, tend to cooperate. And in cyberspace, cooperation is key, is key for, for to being success, successful. That's the reason why I've shown you uh, the ecosystem. That's the reason why uh, I have shown you uh, all the functional areas. Cooperation is, is, a, is a constant attitude, is a constant culture of our organization. Because we all know that if you cooperate, you spend less energy to achieve the same results. Uh, nature shows you that. When birds fly in flocks, they fly in flocks because they, they spend less energy flying together than flying one by one. They are more protected. Uh, so uh, if nature tells us uh, that this is true, why don't we do it? We should do it and in cybersecurity is key. Another thing that I'd like to tell you, and we are in a, above all, technical uh, university, uh, we need to understand that cybersecurity is an enterprise-wide risk management issue. It's not just an IT issue. IT is very important, but it's not only an IT issue. And if you ever go into your future employment and they tell you, the, your boss will tell you, take care of cybersecurity because you are the CIO or the CTO, be aware that this is not a, a very uh, clever or wise approach must be a, an enterprise-wide risk manage, management issue. The, another thing that I would like to tell you is, as almost a final slide, is the best way to be uh, secured, to be protected, is to be prepared. Uh, so s study a lot uh, and uh, improve your knowledge on these, in these areas, because if you go into the the good side of, of, this, of this part, in the white side of this part, you'll also contribute for a, 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 a society that is more cyber secured. This is like riding a bicycle. You always have to be pushing because otherwise you fall down and you smash your bicycle. You don't want to smash your bicycle. You want to to maintain it alive and you want to maintain it upright. That's the reason why this is never, this story is never, never finished because technology is, not, is always changing and people is always imagining thing, ways of using it uh, sometimes in a not, uh, a in a very, in a, in, a, in a strong, in a wrong way. So uh, that's what I would like to tell you. Thank you for your attention and uh, all the best for your courses.